Hi everyone, Carl Steele here, English 4113, the fourth class, which is on the Scottish poet William Dunbar and Miss Ajahnoir. Uh, I'm not going to talk for very long in this session because we have a presenter on Tuesday and she's going to cover some key material, especially on uh, Miss Ajahnoir. So I'm going to concentrate on Dunbar and some of the historical background. Um, so um, one of the things I want to stress is although this poem is uh, quite derogatory about the black woman it's talking about, the, the experience of black people in Europe and also their encounter with Europeans prior to the 15th century wouldn't have necessarily been one in which white people had political dominance. Uh, in fact, they were often met as equals. So let me just stress then that there were black Africans in Europe in various capacities prior to the 15th century. There were there musicians, we've got documented record of court musicians as warriors, uh, certainly uh, fighting for in, in Muslim armies, and also as diplomats, and also as missionaries even. Um, the Europeans would have commonly met black Africans, not only in Europe itself, but also in Jerusalem, which is where Europeans uh, for a time ruled during the period of the Crusades, but also where they traveled very frequently because Jerusalem is a holy city for three religions. Um, Ethiopia was an important place so far as the church in Rome was concerned because it was a long-standing Christian region of Africa. And so far as the Pope was concerned, it was behind enemy lines. That is, is something that uh, the Romans, Roman Catholics could imagine maybe could attack attack Muslim uh, rulers from, from behind. So here's an example of an Ethiopian manuscript. Um, religious manuscripts produced in Ethiopia uh, survive by the hundreds uh, and they're, they're wonderful and beautiful. And as you can see, uh, we've got uh, dark skin representations of Jesus and the Virgin Mary, as you would expect for a uh, religious work produced in Africa. So in 1300 even, the Pope wrote to the quote, dear black Christians of Nubia, so here he's talking about Southern Egypt, I believe, to ask for their help against Muslims. And not long after it, Ethiopian diplomats were sent by their king to the Pope, who was at that time in Avignon in Southern France, to ask for their help against Muslims. Everybody was getting that pressure. So um, this is something I really want to stress. Um, you can see more representations of black people in European art in a massive two volume work in the 1970s, the image of the black in Western art. And so here you, here you see a knight with what are probably African facial features. So uh, the slave trade and uh, Africans in Europe uh, by Europeans begins in the mid 15th century, around 1441 when the Portuguese sail south of the, of the Sahara and start meeting African kings, setting up diplomatic posts, talking to them, doing business, and some of that business involved buying people. Sometimes they bought them, sometimes they simply captured them, but they, they started bringing them to Europe. So we're gonna look at an early record of that in a couple of weeks, but the thing to stress is that the European enslavement of Africans predates the European encounter with the Americans Americas by five decades or so, uh, perhaps even longer. So it's, it's uh, the enslavement of Africans by Europeans is already happening by the time Columbus gets to the Americas. Um, so Portuguese sailors had probably, we can imagine, uh, a cargo of enslaved, kidnapped and enslaved black people. And somehow that ship was uh, probably captured by English or Scottish sailors, and the people were brought to Edinburgh uh, in Scotland, and they probably were not enslaved, although I'm sure they didn't really want to be there. So they were probably treated as servants um, because Scotland and the Scottish were not involved in the slave economy yet, although by the 18th century, uh, much of the wealth of Scotland would have been derived from uh, slave plantations of enslaved people in the Caribbean and the Americas, but we're a very long ways from that yet. So we were very fortunate in having uh, the accounting records uh, that talk about the tournament in which this a black woman was uh, held up 
as a kind of prize for the knights to fight over. This sort of treatment of women in tournaments, which are basically a big sporting event where people would attack each other with swords and, and lances, um, is really not that uncommon. And probably why she's being offered up this way is because she's considered exotic, because she's unusual. And so one of the things that aristocrats wanted was things that were rare and hard to find. And so a black woman would have fit the bill very nicely. What she thought about this, we don't have a record of, unfortunately, but I can imagine she probably was not very happy with it. So you can actually read uh, in, this, in this accounting record, there's each item that was paid for is listed, and here is 29 um, something of cloth for the triumphal chair, the, the, the throne basically, for the black lady, and uh, which uh, taffeta was made from Flanders, so it's imported, imported cloth. And then we have additional cloth to help decorate, decorate this throne that she's gonna be sitting on in this great uh, ritual combat. Um, and then we also have uh, elsewhere in the accounts book, uh, a record of more, more taffeta, more cloth, uh, more things about the, uh, the cloth for the black lady's chair and so on. The thing I really wanna stress is that if you look at this accounting record, there's really nothing at all that's uh, insulting about this woman. Now, again, was she happy to be there? Probably not. Would she have preferred to have gone back home? Probably, I can imagine. Um, but it is a period prior to the widespread European denigration of black people and the widespread attempt by Europeans to present themselves as superior by creating this category of the insulted uh, or lower caste black. So uh, that's important to recognize. However, if you look at the histories of this tournament written, uh, say, about 100 years ago, 120 years ago, by this time, the writers are fully invested in a white supremacist system. And so they are unable to examine the neutrality of the Scottish documents and to accept what's happening in them. Instead, they have to imagine, they project their own prejudices into the past and imagine that King James IV of Scotland, so not King James VI, not the one who's involved in the Bible translation, but King James IV, um, that they imagine that he has exactly the same prejudices against black people that they do. And so if you read through the accounts of the Lord High Treasurer of Scotland, volume three, which is where I find these account books, if you look at the introductory material, you're gonna find um, some extremely nasty language. And you can find these sorts of insulting comments about black women, not only in material produced about 120 years ago, not only in material that was produced in the 1950s, but also in an article that produced as recently as the 1980s or through the middle of the 1980s, even I found continual references that either try to say um, that, that James is, was doing this as some kind of sick joke, because that's the only way they can imagine it. Or they look at Dunbar's poem and they say, it's not that bad. Um, now, Dunbar's poem is that bad. And so the strange thing then is that Dunbar's poem is an outlier. It's unusual to find this degree of anti-Black sentiment in a work, a literary work written by a European that's so early, 1507, maybe 1510 at the latest, I would guess. That's the thing that makes Dunbar so shocking. Not only that it's a racist work, but also that it's so, so precociously racist, right? You would expect something like this to have been written 140 years later, I think. Um, so here's just a little bit of this again. This is Middle Scots. It is uh, very akin to Middle English, but it's not exactly Middle English. It's, it's the Scottish version of that language. Um, and, and as you can see, uh, if you read the glosses, it's, it's really not so hard to understand. And so I will translate this for you on the fly. Um, she is large mouth like an ape and like a toad to grasp onto and her cat's nose turns up, up look, turns up and she shines like silk, my lady with the large lips. 
When she is clothed in rich apparel, she gleams as bright as a tar barrel, as an insult. When she was born, the sun suffered an eclipse. The night, uh, the night is here to fight and quarrel. And so that's a pun on, on a night like a person fights and also night as in the opposite of daylight, uh, my lady with large lips. Uh, the, this line here, when she was born, the sun suffered an eclipse is kind of strange because as we've seen in Brown and other people, uh, that one of the theories of where dark skin came from, at least for Europeans, they understood it to be uh, an effect of too much sun. Instead, this person is carrying her not too, too much sun, but a too little sun, an eclipse. Um, so that's, that's an unusual turn. But as you can see, the poem is just, it's, it's very insulting to her. Um, he's drawing on a language that has much to do with uh, elite European writing about lower class people. The shape of her nose, for example, is something that's often ascribed to lower class people by aristocrats and also the shape of her body, very similar. So it, it's not that she's thought of as a lower class person, but rather the aristocratic language to insult peasants is something that becomes portable into the language of white supremacy. It becomes kind of a part of the toolkit of white supremacy. Um, okay, so one of the ways to understand what's happening here is it's a process of a theoretical concept known as abjection, which is from a, a critical theorist, philosopher, feminist philosopher named Julie Kristeva. Um, and she is, talks about abjection in the way that people will, um, are terrified of Basically, I'm going to read from here, bodily, body leaks, wastes, and fluids, uh, which violate their sense of themselves as clean and proper. And so they always have this very anxious relationship to things that they imagine on the outside of themselves, particularly when those things feel somehow intimate to them. The way that our snot, for example, comes out of our own body and it's sort of of us, but not really of us. Um, and so what we find is that dominant racial and gender groups, I'm going to read this, project things they find abject onto subordinated racial and gender groups. And so basically the things that they find repulsive about themselves, they imagine those things wholly embodied in groups that they want to disdain. So white supremacists and white identifying people who are identifying with white supremacy, whether they know it or not, will often uh, abject qualities they don't like in themselves onto, onto black people. Um, so, um, so what we most commonly, white identified men project what they find abject onto black women. We see this in Dunbar's poem, in fact, and we can talk about how that works in class. And as Moya Bailey and Trudy observe, black men can be guilty of doing this too. Boy, Bailey, in fact, coined the word misogynoir and writing about hip hop. So that's part of this. The uh, abjection is important to understanding it. But then as we're going to hear about in our presentation, misogynoir is also super important in understanding what Dunbar is doing and probably also various forms of colorism. So I'm just going to read this slide to you, but you're going to hear more about it, I think, in Tuesday's presentation. So the key coiners, as you read the article on Moya Bailey, 2008, in her dissertation, was used online in the Crunk Feminist Co Collective. And then Trudy, who's on Twitter as the truths, or at least she was, helped develop and popularize the term from 20, 2012 on. So this is a, by this point, it's a word that's about 12 years old. And it was mocked, it was plagiarized, and it was finally absorbed into pop culture, first on Tumblr, unsurprisingly, and then from 2014 on outside Tumblr by, for example, Katy Perry. Uh, and now the word is everywhere. Um, so the key point, misogynoir, quote, is particular and has to do with the ways that anti-blackness and misogyny combine to malign black women in our world. And we're going to hear more about that on Tuesday. Um, and I also just want to share this with you from Cassini and Boom, Four Tired Tropes that Purposely Explain What Misogynoir Is. And you can imagine uh, some of these in your own experience, people, people uh, you know, perhaps, uh, or media representations you've encountered or things you've been asked to live up to, right, uh, or down to, as the case may be. So things like the sassy black woman, that you're going to encounter that, especially in what I described last Thursday, digital blackface. So the SBW stereotype dehumanizes us by presenting us as cardboard cutouts with no depth and feeling of emotion, just big emotions. The hypersexual Jezebel, so that's probably what Dunbar is drawing on. We are relegated to animalistic and primitive by suggesting that we're unable to exercise self-control, an excuse used to obfuscate the abuse done to us. Uh, the angry black woman, whose trope plays on the idea that any discomfort expressed by a black woman is unreasonable. 
Uh, and so this is something we've seen uh, appearing oftentimes in attempts to dismiss the Black Lives Matter movement uh, or the strong black one. It's been preferable for people to see us as able to deal with anything and everything because then we can be treated in deplorable ways. And here we can even think of the basic anti-blackness of Jefferson's point about black people not needing as much sleep. But then this becomes uh, kind of doubled up when it's talking about black women in a way that they often are not given adequate pain treatment in hospitals, for example. So uh, they're often thought of as more embodied by dominant culture, which is also something that helps us understand what's happening in Dunbar. So again, the thing that we're going to, one of the things I'm hoping to talk about on Tuesday is what we do with the kind of early appearance of so much of this anti-Black stuff in Dunbar's poem in 1507, 1510, thereabouts, when we really would not expect to find it so soon because English people are not going to be involved in the enslavement of Africans in a big way until roughly the 1640s, 1650s on. So at about 150 years later, this just seems like an anachronism. And therefore, it's one of the reasons that I, as a kind of one of studying the history of race and racialization, find this poem so interesting and so worth talking about, even despite its horrific content. Okay, thanks so much. And uh, I'll talk to you more on Tuesday.